11 lane wakes up early in the morning, everyone sets up their market stores so when you get into work you can see people um, setting up their stores, opening the cafes, opening the shops, getting prepared for the lunch hours because uh, lunch hours get busy and amazing smells, I mean people cooking their food, gets you hungry thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. A very important thing not to forget about Leather Lane Market is that it's one of London's very <laughs> oldest street markets. It goes back to the late 16th century. One theory is that it's from a woman's name, an old English woman's name, Leofron. Um, another theory is that it's um, from an old French word for a greyhound. Um, the most likely is it's from an old Flemish word. Um, Louvrun, which uh, means something that's in English is called a soak. Uh, so eventually the, the name changed from Louvrun to Lither and finally to Leather. When the market first started, um, the area had gone downhill a bit from how it had been before. It was probably more pleasant, a lot of fields, it was countryside. But by the late 16th century, when the market was started, it was described as quite a kind of rough... Uh, down market, you could say, um, area. Hatton Garden is named after Sir Christopher Hatton. That was his estate. He asked the Queen if he could have permission to sell, uh, for people to sell things outside of his wall because he wanted the money to pay his debts where he used to gamble. There's been various um, immigrants come into the area. Um, uh, for instance, uh, there's a large Jewish community in Hatton Garden. Um, Hatton Garden's famous for, for jewellery and the diamond trade, and it's very close to Leather Lane. So there's a lot of Jewish people there, and no doubt they used, they used the market. Um, there was a big Italian community there at one time, from the early 19th century up until the mid-20th century or later, an awful lot of Italians lived in the area around Leather Lane, so much so that they called it Little Italy. A lot of them were organ grinders, so they would go around with a mechanical organ playing music, turning um, with monkeys, um, and they would sell ice cream. My father came over with his father from Toscany. My father was a sculptor in figures and statues, he used to work for the church. And my grandfather on my mother's side, he came over here to look for work, so did my grandmother. And they met and they married. Well, my great-grandmother, Giovanna Cimelli, came over from Italy in 1877. All the old people lived in Back Hill, including my grandmother, and Baker's Row. It was more, that's why it was known as Little Italy, because it was just all Italians. And they got their ideas, and they used to bring it over, and bring their ideas of the ice cream, um, the pastry, the cooking, homemade pasta. We didn't have pasta in, in bags, you used to have to make it yourself. In fact, the Italians, they never called it Leather Lane. They used to call it the Blainer. A lot of streets around here were heavily bombed and some parts of Leather Lane were, some of the buildings in Leather Lane were written off in some, if you look at maps showing bomb damage you'll see um, some parts there was total destruction. The Lowstar sweet shop on the corner there, it got bombed. Then his mother-in-law and father-in-law had a sweet shop up there, Jacobs. That got bombed, and that's how Johnson and Matthews built there. I used to work on the asphalt with a friend of mine. 
and there was no work about and he says to me come down and help me um, put the stalls out and that's how I first started and I went on from there I used to have two stalls here one was a fruit stall and one was a salad stall and we used to work seven of us used to work here my father worked in a factory he used to make ladies coats but I didn't like that. I started there when I was a boy and I used to go in there in the morning and it was dark. And when I finished work and came out, it was still dark. So I never saw daylight, so I didn't like that. So I said to him that I'll take some of the coats and go down the market and sell them down there. And that's how I started. You had to wait a lifetime, literally a lifetime, to get a store in this market. You put your name down and then when it came round, it might be a generation or so later, 20, 40, 50, 60 years later, before your name came up and you could start the stall. The fair mystery of the stall is uh, basically, my dad was an old totter from the East End years ago, and he had stalls and he used to sell suits and things like that, and then we progressed into selling socks and pants, and, uh, and the rest is history. I needed some money, I had a record collection, and I was working in the music business, and I needed to pay my rent, so I sold my record collection. Well, first of all, I had a shop and uh, a sandwich bar down here, and then I got rid of that, and I started working on the stall and doing fashion, ladies' fashion. It's not particularly popular as it used to be because we don't manufacture much in this country anymore, and it's not easy to get. So I changed over to food. I sort of fell into markets. I trained to be a chef. When I started, markets was very, very, very good, and. Uh, my son has started to do it because of the problems of getting a job. He's 18 now, so he's kind of fell into it as well, but he's doing okay. The fruit store behind me was my parents' business, and every time I had a break from school, half term, six week holidays, Easter break, Christmas, I would be here working. When I was about five or six years old, and I remember coming to work for my parents in my summer holidays or in my school holidays, and just spending the day just working with them in the stall. This was the high street. These were the, this is where all the residents in these areas came to buy their clothes. It was so packed out that there was, you, you, you just shuffled your way through. You could not walk down here, you had to push your way through. Lots and lots of stalls and loads of people and um, lots of children running around as well when they were on the holiday. It was really a good, good market. The first time I came down I was quite small and everyone was high up, you know, it was quite frightening really, it was very crowded. The kids could run around, walk through the market and everyone knew them and everyone would look out for them and the old people, they'd always help the old people. That's what it is, it's a family market. Very old fashioned, uh, different types of stalls, stalls with like sticks on it and barrows, like little small sheets. Uh, the smell was musky, it was, it, was, it was alive, people used to just sort of, sort of march through here on their way to work every morning, it was fantastic. Years ago there used to be an old boy sitting there, just here, with some weights, he used to stand on his head and do weight tricks. L.B. Falco, he was a lad, he used to put the stalls out for the people, but he used to ride them up, sit on them and push them and have a ride down and put them all out. He was quite a character. There was an old boy sit here, I used to call him Wingy. He had one arm. We used to walk round that corner about 11 o'clock in the morning. He had a little fold up uh, chair tied to the briefcase. He used to put it down, open his chair up, open his briefcase, open the little tennis case up in it. He used to have seven o'clock, blue gillette, and all them silk sword edge razor blades and he would sit there and get a living out of a little play, little thing like that. Sometimes, if it was um, one of the stall holders' birthday, a special birthday, they used to let them put their stall out, and then after a while, they'd sort of go and get his turn or her turn to get the coffee, then they would do come along and they would rearrange the whole stall. This shop here behind us used to be a clothes shop, and there used to be rails and rails of clothes in there, and we had a little dummy rat that looked real. And we larking about in there, we put it on the floor. And then a woman walks in there, didn't know she see the rat, 
went and run out and knocked all the all the rails down and we didn't know we thought it was a joke we picked the rails up the old girl finished up taking it to hospital she had a shock but she was all right she did die they're always messing around the stall holders were like a family down here there was a printing factory they used to teach they used to serve their apprenticeships and when they passed their apprenticeship, they had to put them on a barra and dress them all up, pour paint over them and water, and then they'd run them up and down their delay. I saw this um, fig that was rolling along the ground, and it looked like a perfectly good fig. And then, um, just as I was reaching down to pick the fruit up, the, the, the fruit store um, holder there, who doesn't like having his picture taken, stamped on the thing and stopped me picking it up. Because I think that he thought she should be paying for that thing. Um, and just because I'm throwing it away doesn't mean that she should have it. In more recent times, you've got immigrants from the Commonwealth who would be using the market and working at the market. When we first started, no one knew what a mango was, no one knew what peppers was, no one knew what aubergines was, okra, and all that type of funny food that comes from abroad. No one knew what it was. And then when we started selling it, in the Prudential used to be loads of black ladies doing the cleaning. And they used to line up here on a Thursday and Friday and literally take bags of it home. Uh, immigrants that come into the country, the first place they look to is either in working in factories in a clothing industry, that doesn't exist anymore because everything's made abroad, or the easiest place for them to start work is in a market, because you get a store, you don't need a huge investment, and that's where a lot of immigrants start working. I mean, I've seen this market be predominantly Jewish people, then predominantly Turkish people, and Asian people, but there's always been a mixture of, of everybody because the streets are for everyone to work. Years ago, they used, you want to work the market, all you had to do, go somewhere, you buy a bit of gear, you come out, you put it out, you sold it, and that was it, over and done with. Now, there's a lot of red tape. You can't just turn up at a market and say to the inspector, right, I want a stall like we used to 20 years ago. Now, you've got to have all your paperwork in place, you've got to have insurance, where years ago, a lot of immigrants would have come into the market. It's now a lot more difficult for them to just turn up and start working the market. Post-war times, in the 1950s and 1960s, you've got a lot more office workers um, based in the Hoban area. Um, so they would use the market a lot at lunch times when they were on their lunch break. And so, so much so that Leather Lane became one of the most um, popular lunchtime markets in London. At the time, there were no computers, so all the girls were typing. And there was typing pools. So at lunchtime, you had literally thousands and thousands of people coming out of there to walk down into the market. Those people are not there anymore because those, those jobs don't exist. A lot less busy than it used to be and it tends to be mainly office workers at lunchtime. People don't tend to do their shopping there anymore. They buy bits and pieces and if they're out at lunchtime they'll go and get a snack and they might see a bargain but they don't tend to go there for shopping anymore. We started a campaign called Leather Lane Stars and we did this because we, we love this market. It's a place we work just around the corner and we come and eat in the market and we buy things in the market and we noticed that the market was shrinking. What we wanted to do was to encourage people to support the market because right now there's a danger that it shrinks so much that it um, disappears altogether. Because London's become so expensive, it's, um, it's reduced the amount of people that are able to work. I mean, things like congestion charge, fuel prices, um, the, pr the, the cost to rent stalls, etc. they've all gone up. So. Um, so traders, they, they can't really make it pay anymore. Yeah, things have changed, it's got a little bit harder. There's a lot of competition from shops, supermarkets and everything else. You know, it's got hard for everyone. And a lot of buildings surrounding us were workshops which used to support the uh, jewellery trade, had some garden adjacent to us. But in the last 15 years, that's slowly been um, moving out. 
and you'll find now that a lot of it is now residential. It's been styled on the New York loft apartments and uh, those persons tend to be a bit of a nuisance because they want it nice and quiet in the morning when we're trying to set up and do our job. Unless people really want markets to work, unless councils really want markets to work, they won't, you see. And slowly over the years they've become less important, shall we say, where really they should be concentrated on. A few more younger people, that's what we need. People who want to give it a try. And if the councils work with them, I think markets can come back again. A lot of the trendy markets are. Um, I shop it because I love it. I love being here. I love this place. It's like visiting an old friend, you know. You, you get used to certain things, you know, it, and it feels good. It's just a slice of life. It's a big um, collection of different people in London. Um, and it's, it's what London's best at, is mixing everybody up. And you need a market to bring them together. I like that it's very unique. You get a lot of the things here you can't buy anywhere else. Uh, I think it's good value. And I think it's, it's, it's like not even being in London when you walk around here. It's like uh, almost like being on holiday. So I, I find it quite relaxing to walk around. Apart from when people from school try and interview me for things like this. I like that it's still very independent and there's still a lot of um, individual stall owners. I, I just really like Cheese Man. I really like Cheese Man and um, when I go to Cheese Man like I have today, uh, I phone up a few friends and I say, he's got Borson too for a pound today, how much do you want? So I'm actually even buying for other people because his uh, cheese deals are so wonderful. Yeah. I'm the last one here, I'm the oldest one and the last one here. All the others are dead and buried. So I can't help you with them. <laughs> That's you want to dig them up. <laughs>